So uh, you used to say that everything is well, but when I look in the newspapers and turn off, turn on the television, I don't think it seems so well. So can you please talk about that just a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So when I, when I mean everything is well, everything is perfect, everything is divine, what I mean by that is that when we wake up out of our mind and just come into the clear space of awareness, the clear space of presence that we are, when we step out of our mind fully, there's no sense of judgment about how the world is. We just see the world and we experience the world as this vast, innate perfection. And so with our mind, what our mind does is our mind judges the world and our mind has an argument that the world should be different than how it is. But when we just come into the natural state, the natural state of being, the natural state of presence, we will notice that inside who and what we are is absolutely perfect, absolutely divine. And what I mean by that is I'm, I'm talking about our unborn nature. You know, the, the nature that we've always had our entire life. Like when we were a baby and we were born into this world, we were born into this innate perfection. In the spaciousness of our mind, in the quietness of our mind, there's a sense of purity, a sense of openness, a sense of unity, just this sense of, of vibrancy and love. And this sense of vibrancy and love, it animates our being. It animates every part of our body. It animates every part of this world. If, if, it, if that wasn't the case, you know, if this love did not animate our body, we would, we would not be alive. And so the invitation is, is for us just to step into this presence. This is natural state that we are. When we step into this natural state, through not believing in our mind, but through stepping out of our egoic mentality, we realize that there's innate perfection that holds the entire world together, that the entire world arises out of. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I do understand what you mean because I, uh, I can relate to that. I felt that. But at the same time, when I see something, some great injustice or someone who is in great pain because inflicted by other people, it, 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 uh, it really also makes me think and feel that this isn't right, this shouldn't sure. be, and we should change it. Sure. So how do, we, how do we, if we accept, and if we accept everything and think it's well and fine, how will we ever get the impulse to change things that aren't, sure. you know? Yeah, well, what, what you're doing is you're talking about there's, there's these two, two big aspects of being, there's these two big aspects of God, and one is the unborn aspect, which is that everything is perfect, everything is divine, everything is vast, open, spacious, free, and clear. Like, if you just look at the nature of the universe, you know, right now, somewhere in the universe, you know, there's a star that's dying, there's a black hole that's eating the star, that's eating planets, that it's, that's eating the whole universe. You know, from the mind of God, you know, that is an aspect of evolution. That's just an aspect, you know, of this world. Is that things come, things go, things die. And but ultimately, when we look at things from a vast perspective, we also see that things are growing. And so, if we're going to be free, we must first accept everything as it is. You know, for example, if I'm really angry at somebody, you know, if I have anger within myself, you know, I can try to just argue with that person, and oftentimes nothing will change. There will just be these two people arguing with each, with each other. But if I can step out of my anger and step into my innate freedom, if I can see myself as perfect, if I can see the situation as perfect, if I can see the other person as perfect, and by perfect I mean just see them for who and what they are, beyond any sense of judgment, beyond any sense of righteousness, beyond any sense of wanting it to be different. And just coming just to this clear, just Zen-like space of everything's okay. It's okay that they're arguing with me. It's okay that in my egoic mind it's resisting it. You know, it's okay that the world is the way it is. 
when we step into that great okayness, there's a sense of freedom. There's a sense of clarity. There's a sense of, of seeing the experience just as it is. Yes, I, I, I do understand that because uh, when, I, when I can do that, if I'm in, in an argument that's really freeing and it's, it's really helping, yeah. but I'm thinking about more dramatic and awful things than someone oh, who's in an argument. Of course, of course, and I, no, I didn't get to this, the second part of what I was going to say. Sorry. No, it's okay, it's fine. And the second part of what I was going to say is that from this space of openness, from this space of seeing clearly like, okay, this is what's happening. You know, if we can step out of our argument and just step in just to this crystal clear clarity of, okay, there's a situation that's arising. From this space of openness, we can get in touch with this intuitive intelligence of how to respond. Now, if we don't first step out of our mind, we're just going to respond from our ego to their ego. And again, that's what causes the argument. It, you know, Any argument, any problem in this life and in this world is because we're responding to life from our, from our egoic nature or someone is responding to us from their egoic nature. And this goes you know, with anything from as terrible as you know, torture, rape, kidnapping, war, to, you know, something as simple as, you know, we're arguing with someone over a parking space. And so the first invitation is for us just to step into this innate silence, which is here, let go of our egoic mentality, and begin to see clearly. And then when, we, when we're open in this way, there's an intuitive intelligence that can come forward and that can act through us as us. And so as this intelligence comes forward, perhaps I might not argue you know, with whoever it is that I had the argument with. Perhaps I may just listen to them because I've let my egoic mind fall. When our egoic mind is you know, in the forefront of our consciousness, we're not really listening to each other. We're just planning our attack or we're, we're planning our, our defense. But if I can let that ego die within me, and just come into this present space and actually hear the person who's arguing with me, to hear the the other nation that's warring with us, to hear, you know, whatever it is that's troubling the person, then there can be true true change. There can be true change because this change can come from this higher intelligence, like a divine intelligence, an intuitive intelligence, a heartfelt intelligence. And the only way that that change is going to happen is if we first step out of our ego. Like we've all seen in this world, we've seen very sophisticated egos try to create governments. We've seen very sophisticated philosophies, you know, that have been brought forth, and people have all kinds of wonderful ideas. But with the, when the idea and the philosophy, it just when it comes from more ego, it's met with ego. Yeah, and I think, I think love, there could be a real sense of change in the world. This, yeah, this, this, I. I totally agree with you and I think we can come very far with this but don't you think there are some people who won't change how much no, ma no matter how much we listen to them I mean mm -hmm. can there be people that should just be stopped you know sure sure absolutely so we live in an evolutionary world and I, I wasn't saying that we'll just that we just sit here and listen but I'm saying when we begin to listen to someone, you know, in a compassionate way, oftentimes we can hear what their struggle is, and we can find that there's something deeper than their ego that's driving them. There's a sense of pain that's within them. And if we can meet them at that level, there's an opportunity for change. And the same is true within ourselves. But of course there's there's moments in time, you know, in history when it's appropriate to set boundaries. Absolutely. There's that it's appropriate to set boundaries in different situations. And so when we step out of our egoic consciousness, you know, which just says, you know, our egoic consciousness normally says there's a right way, there's a wrong way. I normally have the right way, they have the wrong way. But if we're willing to step into something greater by listening, I don't mean just listen to the other person's ego. I mean listening to an intuitive movement, a descent of divinity, a descent of higher intelligence, that can come down through us and act through us as us. Or we can listen in our heart and ask our heart, how should I respond to this situation? Sometimes our heart will tell us to stand up and fight. You know, sometimes our heart will tell us to turn the cheek. 
You know, if you look at any great being throughout history, you know, sometimes they fought and sometimes they turned their cheek. You know, even, even someone like Gandhi or Martin Luther King, they put up an incredible fight. But it came from this presence of love. It didn't come from their egos. It came from this presence of love. And they were able to create incredible change in this world. And so this is the kind of listening that I'm speaking about. Yes, and I, I, it really resonates with me, and I totally understand what you mean. But I just want to, I want to go as far as I can with this question. So, sure, please, please. Um, so, can it be that sometimes violence and war can be the right thing to do? It appears so. It appears so. Yeah, by right, I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean by right. Okay, I but mean, we, uh, I mean, can, can, can. Um, God uses all means. God uses all means. Yeah. And so you know, right or wrong, you know, that's a question of you know what's, you know, what what we're judging right or wrong. Okay, so but God, uh, God will use God will use all means. If you look at the universe that God has created, God has created an evolutionary world, and so at some point in evolution, you know, wars was a step forward, but yeah. hopefully at a greater a greater step in in evolution, dialogue will be a step forward, you know, and at, and another step in evolution, you know, perhaps meditation and you know being intuitive will be a step forward. But who's to say if that's right or wrong? Well, it's you know that's what's happening in this world. If you look at the world, you know, from a vast perspective, from an evolutionary perspective, you'll see that different people, different nations, different, you know, whatever, are, are at different stages of their of their development. The whole world is at different stages of development. You know, some life forms, you know, um, you know, pounce on each other and, and eat each other through <laughs> ripping each other apart. You know, with their claws. You know, if you look at the life of a tiger, that's what a tiger does. But we can't say that that's wrong. But you know, from a perspective of our, our humanity, we see that you know some people, you know, are fighting with guns. Some people are fighting with bows and arrows. Some people are fighting with words, and other people are trying to come together through a sense of unity through their mind. And other people are trying to come together through a sense of unity through a sense of of divinity and a sense of oneness. So there's all different levels, you know, of of people and of, of beings on this planet. So what's right or wrong, you know, who's to say? But it seems that it seems that the more in touch we are with our hearts, the more in touch we are with our divinity, then that correlates with a greater sense of unity, a greater sense of oneness. And so when we're experiencing oneness, oftentimes we're not in the mood for violence. But there are times when God uses violence. Yeah. I think uh, it's just something, sometimes it's, it's sort of scary for me to accept, to say yes to things I really don't like. Sure. Because I am afraid that with this acceptance, there will follow a, a sort of um, apathy or um, not caring, not wanting to change injustice, and yeah. That is in no way what I'm speaking about. With acceptance, it doesn't mean you agree with it. It doesn't mean that you like it. It doesn't mean you allow it to continue. But acceptance means you're no longer fighting with it in your mind. And because you let go of your argument in your mind, then you have all this freedom to see the situation clearly and to respond to the situation from your heart. So acceptance may it may mean, you know, realizing, you know, my partner is being, you know, mean and violent to me, and you accept that and you see it clearly, and then your heart says, Okay, it's time to leave. You know, acceptance doesn't mean that you're a doormat in any way, and I would never want to teach that. If you look at any of the incredible masters throughout history, they weren't doormats. They didn't just accept it and roll over and play dead. You know, they said, this is what's happening. That's the acceptance. It's just acceptance is a sense of you see it clearly. You're not arguing with it in your mind. You see it clearly, 
and then you ask your heart, how should I respond? Yeah, and that's really the, way that the movement from your heart just comes forward. And sometimes the movement from your heart will, you know, stand up and say, hey, you can't talk to me this way. Sometimes yeah. the movement of your heart will say, hey, I'm done here. You know, please excuse me. Sometimes the acceptance of our heart will say, well, I'm going to sit with this and I'm going to listen to this person. And I'm going to ask them why they're treating me this way. Yeah, so the paradox here, it's really nice to come to this conclusion because the paradox is like, for me, it's like um, when we give up on a certain level, when we give up the fight against how things are, yeah, it comes an enormous power and strength from that. Yeah. So it's sort of both giving up and acting on it. It yeah, yeah we, have to, we have to give up our allegiance with our mind, with our egoic mentality, with our, you know, our emotional agenda. So we give up that, we surrender that, and then we see clearly. And then we let this greater force guide us, whether you call that God, divinity, intuition, you know, your heart, prajna, whatever. We want to get in touch with that innate wisdom, the wisdom of the universe, and allow it to guide us. And so this is what embodied freedom is like, is when we allow this force to guide us, in a sense, to even go further than guide us, when we allow this force to be us and to move in the world as us. It's a, it's a radically different way of living than meeting our life from the perspective of our egoic mind. And, and as we transition out of our egoic mind, there will be a sense of fear from letting go because what our ego does is our ego actually defends us from life. It, tr it tries to protect us. That's its function. As we let go of that shield, as we let go of that defense, there may be a great deal of anxiety that we face as it comes forward. And as we're letting the walls down, we're meeting the life in an open-hearted way. And then there we'll have to take a sense of faith or a sense of trust that this greater thing is going to guide us. Yeah. Thank you. It's really about letting go of control. It's absolutely about letting go of control yeah. and, and being open to receiving this greater wisdom to come through us as us. Yeah, and this is what it means to be both, both free and embodied. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. It's, it's good to meet with you.